While Lisa Sue has done a tremendous job of bringing AMD back from the brink of bankruptcy in the last decade, it's becoming clear that AMD has lost a clear sense of direction or strategic positioning when we look at how AMD's competitors are getting further ahead of them since Lisa took the helm, especially in the last five years. The last time AMD was competitive in the graphics arena was when they launched their power-hungry R9 290X back in 2013, which for a short while was the final fastest GPU on the market, forcing Nvidia to scramble to bring out the 980Ti as quickly as possible. And that was before Lisa joined as CEO. And ever since then, discrete graphics took a backseat and lost ground not only to Nvidia, but also recently to graphics newcomers like Apple and Qualcomm, who went their own way using ARM-based solutions. In the x86 PC market, even Intel is now looking to capture the low-end and the mid-range GPU consumer market, where a AMD once had a word to say. As far as CPUs are concerned, Intel still holds the lead in mobile despite numerous attempts from AMD to capture that segment, and now with Qualcomm making a serious push for it, and Apple being as consolidated as ever in the upper mid-range and premium mass market. Apple, once an AMD graphics customer, now runs cycles around them with their own integrated solutions, and AI has shown how stretched thin AMD are, with no one showing any any interest in AMD's offerings, be it for training or inference. And compute, while still bringing in some cash, is now mostly relegated to custom orders from government scientific agencies and some academics, which basically pay for the R&D. I think there are some worrying signs of not only stagnation, but also contraction that suggests that perhaps it's time for Lisa to step down, and perhaps it's time for a more focused and bold vision for the company to be implemented by new blood. This video is sponsored by urcdkeys.com. If you pay full price for a Windows 11 key, you are wasting your money. Instead, you can get a Windows 11 OEM key from urcdkeys.com for just over $29 or even lower at $21.86 if you use my coupon code C25 at checkout. All urcdkeys product keys are on sale right now, so don't miss the Super Spring sale. Follow the link below to the Windows 11 page at you urcdkeys.com. Click purchase, enter your C25 discount code. You can pay with a credit card or PayPal, and then just add the Windows key to your Windows activation settings and you're done. The code is sent to you within minutes, by the way. You can also use my C25 code on other products. So if you need Office 2019, make sure to get it from urcdkeys.com for a much lower price than retail. Check the exclusive links in the video description to get your cheap OEM Windows or Office keys to Today from urcdkeys.com. While I am a Lisa Sue fanboy, and if you follow my channel for a while, you might have noticed that I have a predilection for the young Lisa wallpaper, which I feature extensively in my reviews. And while I do think Lisa Sue did a tremendous job bringing AMD back from the dead, particularly in her first five years as CEO, I believe the time may have come for new blood to guide AMD in the next decade towards a position of leadership before the company goes the way of IBM. If you think this is hyperbole, then I suggest you stick around as AMD's numbers are not as rosy as people might think. Lisa joined AMD in 2012 as Senior Vice President and became CEO in 2014. She confronted significant challenges like the FX line of processors being horrendous compared to Intel's offerings at the time and a GPU division struggling to streamline itself. In the years since, Lisa has steered the company towards profitability and financial sustainability and as a result, AMD stock has risen 60-fold compared to 2014. One of Lisa's great success stories was in the high-performance and adaptive computing arena, with a long stint as a leader in supercomputing, for instance, with the third-gen Epic plus AMD Instinct 250X-based Frontier still leading in some areas. The bet in more cores really paid off there, with Frontier having over half a billion cores. So for compute-focused workloads, there's no doubt that AMD took 
took things to another level under Lisa, but the cost of her shift in focus from client computing to high performance compute came, in my opinion, at great long term cost. Even if in the short term it gave AMD a significant moneymaker and saved AMD from potential bankruptcy. Looking back, it's now clear that the Zen strategy focused on the scalability of the architecture in the HPC arena at the expense of its performance in latency sensitive markets like our niche here, the PC enthusiast. While Intel decided to focus on specialization for each market, playing catch up in the core count metric, AMD created a platform aimed at the high margin markets that could also be used as a decent consumer level product. The chiplet strategy worked wonders in achieving this goal while also being financially sound. But I think that might have led to Lisa's first mistake. She should have been looking ahead towards the second half a decade of her tenure to move beyond the chiplet strategy into a disaggregated one, similar to what Intel is now trying to do, with mixed results, and diversified AMD's offerings beyond x86. As a result, AMD ended up stagnating and putting all its eggs into the 16 core for the masses strategy that worked so well in the past, without realizing that a large portion of the market was demanding improvements in other areas instead, like faster single core speeds, specialized hardware for specific workloads, and lower power consumption in the mobile space. All things that don't fit into a chiplet strategy all that well because of data movement between dyes and the energy required for that. One of Lisa's cardinal sins during most of her 10 year tenure was her very poor discernment when putting together a competent and consistent marketing team. It's a meme now that AMD's marketing has done as much to harm their brand as their competitors. Poor communication, a lack of focus on who their target audience is, childish jabs at their competitors with no real valid ground to stand on in the form of competitive products, and with their marketing materials full of misleading information and just outright lies about performance. On top of that, there were AMD's poor investment into esports sponsorships, a crowd that couldn't be more disconnected from PC builder nerds, and then in the last few years, partnering with LGBTC 3 p plus influencers who again, whatever your opinion on that is, are typically not the evangelists that AMD needs as they have absolutely no connection to the brand's products or even to the PC segment. The high entropy of AMD's catastrophic marketing efforts ended up leaving many long-time customers feeling ignored, betrayed, and just ashamed of being associated with AMD. The triumvirate of Herkelman, Halleck, and Frankazorus Rex had an insistence on using all school media like PC World as a platform for communicating their vision and product features led to a lot of embarrassing moments, with the going meme being that AMD is AMDing themselves whenever another blunder occurs. A company the size of AMD simply cannot have a bunch of amateurs handling their marketing, and Lisa failed to fix that years ago. Herkelman and Halleck have left, but it remains to be seen if we'll see better product launches this year from a messaging perspective. I think another of Lisa Su's cardinal sins was not capitalizing on AMD's unique selling point, the CPU plus GPU advantage that they had for so long, which is now gone, or rather not unique to them anymore. After Zen 3 launched especially, and like I pointed out repeatedly back then, I think AMD should have designed a strategy that would entice their CPU buyers to invest in a Radeon GPU also, by offering bundles, discounts, and a program that would bring long-term loyalty maybe offering coupons for future AMD products to those who bought a Radeon GPU along with a Zen 3 CPU. They could have had segment-specific bundles. So back in 2021, perhaps offer a bundle with the ever-popular R5 5600X along with the Radeon 6700 XT, which came out a few months after that, and offer both for $650. So $650 for the bundle, that is, even if this meant AMD made no profit on the GPU and getting consumers to evangelize an all AMD platform would have set the stage for Zen 4 and a better RDNA 3 reception. And there are many other ways in which AMD can have capitalized on this advantage, which neither Intel nor Nvidia had at the time of being able to offer a whole platform. Well, that boat has now sailed, with Intel having their own discrete GPUs and Nvidia sooner or later launching a consumer focused ARM based CPU platform, as I've been saying for years now. And the damage done to AMD's image by by 
their poor marketing decisions now has no consumer loyalty to rely on for a revival. Even if they manage to release great products this year, there's barely any enthusiasm around AMD anymore. Speaking of ARM, when Lisa joined, one of her first decisions was to kill off Jim Keller's work on an ARM-based AMD CPU. Codenamed K12, Keller's ARM CPU for AMD was meant to be a 64-bit ARM V8 core. This core was designed to help diversify AMD's product offerings beyond x86 and target servers, embedded systems, and particularly ultra-low power client devices. So your notebooks, tablets, and whatnot. It was a wide out-of-order core with high IPC, ranging from a 2-core to an 8-core, codenamed Ascalon. Now, this was back in 2012 to 2015, right at the onset of Lisa's tenure. And this is basically the approach that Apple took for the M series of ARM chips, which incidentally came from the work that Jim Keller did at Apple when designing the A4 and A5. The K12 ARM core that Keller designed for AMD was a massive improvement over Excavator, but also featured a high bandwidth, low latency cache system to enhance performance in single-threaded applications. There are several reasons which one could consider valid for why AMD canned the project, but to me, the most egregious was not seeing the potential of the nascent ARM server market in the 2013 to 2017 days, thinking that making the x86 Zen strategy work was the safer bet. But more telling was the fact that AMD considered that their ARM chips would not have an immediate revenue potential, so they weren't seen as a sound pursuit. Looking back, this was tremendously short-sighted from Lisa Su and company. AMD could have had a unique offering in the server market and could have had an M1-like chip in 2017 in the consumer space well ahead of Apple, which with the right partnerships could have created a new market for PCs well ahead of everyone else and set the stage for the following decade. Considering Intel's solid grasp of the PC market, Zen should have been a backup plan, not the sole strategy. Worse still, while one could argue that AMD was thin on resources to bring to market two core architectures simultaneously in the form of the new Zen products and the K12 core, it seems strange that after the success of Zen and the money that started coming in, AMD did not revive the K12 core now that they had the resources to do so. There were three years between the launch of Zen 1 and Apple's M1 in which AMD could have brought the K12 to market, but instead considered it redundant now that all eyes were on Zen. Well, the numbers speak for themselves. According to Canalis, Q4 2023 ended with Intel increasing their PC share by 3% to 78% of the market, while AMD lost 1% to just 13% of the market. An Apple with 6 million units shipped is not that far behind AMD at 8 million, but Apple has higher revenue at 8 billion compared to AMD's 5 billion. It will be interesting to see if outside of Apple, ARM-based machines will take hold of consumers by the end of this year, especially with the highly anticipated Snapdragon X Elite and X Plus SoCs. More on that in upcoming videos. When Lisa Su joined, AMD actually had a higher share of PCs at 15% of the market compared to Intel's 75%. So focusing on X86 has kept the company around, but it hasn't really materialized in higher market share with the Zen cores. In fact, it has decreased. And with no diversification outside the x86, it's questionable if there's room to grow in the next 10 years, especially with performance on the CPU side already being more than plentiful for most users, with no need to upgrade for 5 plus year cycles. So one has to ask, where is AMD's growth going to come from? Now, you might think that AMD missed the boat on the consumer space with ARM, but made the right bet in servers with their epic line of many core CPUs. But did they? You might be surprised to hear that AMD does not have the second highest market share in the server market and is not even number three. Google is the current number three ahead of AMD by a significant margin already and is encroaching on Intel, who have been nose diving from almost 80% in Q1 2020 to around 15% at the end 
of last quarter. In fact, Google will almost certainly jump to second place with their ARM-based Axion CPUs launching later this year. And as we all know, NVIDIA is enjoying their time in the sun with the AI boom, of course. In fact, AMD is only about 4% higher now than they were in 2020 when their third-gen Epic launched. All the while, both NVIDIA and Google will likely dominate the next five plus years with ARM-based solutions, not x86. At every level, Lisa's decision to abandon Jim Keller's K12 has been a clear misjudgment. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Last but certainly not least, a long-lasting hindrance to AMD's growth since Lisa took over is an over-reliance on custom orders, resulting in a risk-averse strategy across the board, which has left the company with very little to offer in terms of unique selling points. If you don't know what I'm talking about, take a look at AMD's latest financial report, or really any financial report from the last decade. And this is from their cautionary statement. Material factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from current expectations include, without limitation, the following. AMD's ability to generate revenue from its semi-custom SoC products. AMD's reliance on Microsoft and other software vendors' support to design and develop software to run on AMD's products. The Xbox and PlayStation custom SoCs are perfect examples of this. In years where a new console is projected to come out, AMD will invest heavily in things like graphics technology or on-chip memory. In the years where there is no money coming in from Sony and Microsoft to pay for R&D, AMD just iterates on existing products, like we will see this year with RDNA 4, if rumors are true. You can bet that if a new generation of consoles was coming out, we wouldn't be seeing an iterative microarchitecture for Radeon this year, but a brand new one with a heavy investment in silicon. Same goes for any feature that AMD launches, where it has to piggyback on Microsoft's innovations rather than create their own and risk being left to support it themselves. There's no build it and they will come mentality inside AMD. Instead, there's an overly cautious strategy of only investing in safe bets that will have an immediate impact on revenue. It's short-sighted and I think it has positioned AMD in precarious waters compared to their competitors, which have no qualms in making daring bets with calculated risks, like Intel's disaggregated strategy, doubling down on their foundry business and opening it up, and their recent acquisition of Silicon Mobility, or Nvidia's numerous ventures into AI when no one was talking about it, branching out into CPUs, game streaming, and now robotics. Where is AMD in all of this? They are followers, not leaders. They are waiting for Microsoft to come up with some API, or for Sony to ask them for a PlayStation Pro chip. There's no vision outside of the status quo. Nowadays, AMD just copies whatever their competitors do, usually poorly, and it seems that will be the same with AI and robotics if they even venture into that. Before we get into who I think could be a good successor to Lisa, I think it's important to identify what AMD could focus on in the next decade and how they can get ahead of their competitors in some key areas. Firstly, I think the ARM boat has sailed and it's now time for Risk v to take its place. Well, not right now, but five years from now. We've seen Tenstorrent already having success with it, as well as Nvidia, and I think it would be wise for AMD to make a bold bet on Risk v looking ahead at what's after ARM that could allow them to dictate the terms of the instruction set innovations for their products rather than depending on Intel and x86, perhaps creating a set of lean processes designed for specific tasks, which could represent the first pieces of a larger mosaic, an open platform that could accept chiplets from other manufacturers with AMD at the center of it. I think that would be a wise bet. AMD missed the opportunity with ARM with great potential losses, and I I think they shouldn't repeat the same mistake now with Risk v especially now that it's gained traction. It's the what comes after ARM move that AMD can make to anticipate everyone else within the next five years. They still have Ryzen to fall back on in the next few years, but I don't think that should remain their main focus, not the way things are headed.
Secondly, I think it's obvious that AMD has no AI strategy worthy of that name, no enticing products in that segment, and are squandering away the bat they made in Xilinx, at least as far as integrating the Xilinx IP into AMD's other products. I don't know if you've noticed, but no one is looking to do training on AMD hardware, and no one seems interested in doing inference either. No enough significance anyway. Most of the big players have their own chips or are making massive orders of Nvidia's clusters. The CUDA mode is strong, and AMD doesn't have an answer for it, with only a modicum of attention given to Rockcom. If I were in AMD's shoes, I would be looking at the client side of things when it comes to AI, as I feel like that's where things are not completely defined yet. As I was revising this video, Microsoft just announced basically what I was going to suggest that AMD should do in the form of Copilot Plus PCs, an OS-wide AI integration. The upcoming Strix APUs, particularly the Strix Halo with unified LPDDR5X memory and with over 40 Tera ops, seems like a good candidate to be running AI widgets that are contextual to what you are doing in the OS. What I was envisioning for AMD in the form of a hardware plus software co-design integration of AI into client devices has turned out to be another Microsoft innovation that AMD will piggyback on. One can expect benchmarks of these AI features shown at AMD's Ryzen 9000 series launch in the near future. But I feel like that's not really going to give AMD an exclusive, unique selling point. Just another cyclical performance race with Intel and others. Thirdly, still looking forward, I think AMD needs to build a whole new marketing team that's more in touch with who their core audience is. I think that's obvious to everyone. They need to abandon esports sponsorships and woke influencers and get back to their roots. Rebuild a base of evangelists that will promote their products organically. You cannot beat Nvidia at their own game. You need to carve out your own niche by catering to the enthusiast crowd instead of just copying everything Nvidia does with a six-month delay minimum, sometimes a year behind like with FSR 3. AMD needs to dissociate themselves from all media like PC World and Digital Foundry and that sort of nebulous journalism filled with conflict of interest shenanigans and focus on enthusiast channels and social media. They need to focus on people who tinker with hardware, who like to push things, min-max, and reward them with a feeling of accomplishment where they can get more out of their hardware than they paid for. And these people will be the ones marketing AMD's products for them in terms of regaining brand confidence. Confidence, AMD also needs to stop doing predatory segmentation and locking hardware features or overclocking. The only way to be Nvidia's marketing and brand awareness is either to go over them, so release even more expensive and more niche products exclusive to the wealthy, kind of like an audio file strategy, which I personally think would be a mistake, or go under them and cater to niches rather than the normies where Nvidia has a hold. Start from there and grow organically. Now, when it comes to choosing a new CEO, I would go about it in a not very conventional way. I would either buy Tenstorrent or merge with them and have Jim Keller become CEO of AMD that way. That would instantly give AMD a foundation to build from when it comes to a bat on Risk v and a challenge to Nvidia's CUDA mode in AI and get probably the best man for the job at this stage in AMD's life. Keller's previous experience at the company means he already knows part of the team as well as the and architecture, so that would make for a smoother transition. Kala not being an option, or rather buying or merging with Tenstor and not being on the cards, I would go with Raja Kaduri. I know that a lot of people seem to think that Raja is the one responsible for some of AMD's poor GPU products in the past, but I believe those comments come from a position of ignorance of how hardware is designed at this level. With Raja being the public figure during the Fury and Vega years, it's only natural that he gets the fall for those failures. But if if you knew what was going on inside both AMD and Intel, you'd know that he was actually the only reason those companies had a working product to begin with. I doubt Raja would be interested in the job, but there's no doubt that AMD's focus would change with him, and we would see a company that was less conservative and more focused on innovating rather than copying competitors or iterating on existing products. And speaking of thinking outside the box, my final choice would be Satoshi Matsuoka, current head of the Riken Center for Computation 
computational science in Japan. This would be a choice that would double down on AMD's bat and compute for sure, but he's also a man who has shown he can really think outside the box when it comes to developing solutions for specific tasks, as his Fujitsu A64FX CPU shows. He is also someone who dabbled in video games in his youth, developing the pinball and rollerball games for the NES in the mid-80s, with none other than the late Satoru Iwata, former Nintendo president. I think with someone like Matsuoka, AMD would gradually transition into a different kind of company and abandon the client businesses and hyper-focus on data center and AI, which obviously is not something I would personally like, but it could be the right direction for AMD. But like I said, while not new blood per se, Kala would be the best call, and acquiring Tenstorrent would add a whole new dimension to AMD that I think they desperately need. What about you? Who would you put in charge? Would you let Lisa go to begin with? Do you think she should stay on and continue leading AMD as she has in the last 10 years? And which areas do you think AMD should be focusing on in the next decade? Let me know down in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts. This video was made possible by my awesome patrons. Join my Patreon for a couple of dollars a month and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server. Thanks for watching and until the next one.